People would never worship a golden cow, right? Maybe they did 3,500 years ago in ancient days, but not now. Not on Wall Street. Hmm. Not in England. Hmm. Not in Belgium. What? Another cow? Why all these cows? Is there something about the worship of the golden calf in the book of Exodus that all these modern day idols are trying to communicate to us? Are they warning us that the golden calf account is going to repeat in six different ways in the end times? Yes, it is. And it should be no surprise. The apostle Paul told us, for I do not want you to be unaware, brethren. So he wants us to know this, that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That, of course, is talking about the Exodus. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happened as examples for us so that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 and 7. So Paul is warning us that we will be tempted to crave the same things they did. The golden calf, so to speak, and calves are all over the world. And they're warning us. So today, we're going to dig into the account of the worship of the golden calf, just as Paul indicated. Find out the end time applications of this account so that we can be prepared for what's coming our way in the very near future, and frankly, for what has already begun. Now, I want you to watch the whole video because the sixth way is the most uncanny and amazing way that this is going to repeat. It's going to be linked to the red heifers. It's going to be related to transhumanism, if you can believe that. These things were hidden back in this ancient account as ways for us to understand what's going to happen in the future. So make sure you watched and see that sixth way. But first, a shout out to Michael Terran of our advisory board who researched this video for us and our other advisory board members. So let's get started. And the first way that this is going to repeat is that the golden calf was, after all, a cow. But why a cow? Of all the animals the Israelites could have made into an idol, why a cow? Well, the Israelites came out of Egypt, so it must have been an Egyptian idol, and yes, it was. The very first Egyptian goddess was known as Hathor, who was depicted as a cow, at least with the horns of a cow in a lot of pictures. She was the mother goddess and a sky goddess, and she was the goddess of war and power. Quite a combination. And as we saw at the beginning of the video, multiple bovine animal statues have appeared already throughout the world, and they're associated with power and wealth as well. The charging bull on Wall Street is associated with the power of money and wealth. The woman riding the beast outside of the EU's headquarters in Brussels is associated with government. The woman riding the mechanical bull at the Commonwealth Games in England was associated with entertainment and sports, which is also an area of power. Worship of money, government, and entertainment pretty much sums up modern society, doesn't it? These three things, money, government, entertainment, are the seats of power in this world, and people worship them. Just watch a football match, either U.S. football or what Americans call soccer overseas. That is worship happening in the stands. People rely on money and government for their provision and security rather than God himself. And what you trust, you worship. It becomes an idol. So this has already repeated. The second way this worship of the golden calf is repeating in the end times is Hathor was also the Egyptian goddess of sensuality and sex, much as Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte, and Venus were in their respective cultures. After the Israelites made the calf, they resorted to a wild party-like festival, the kind that they had back in Egypt for Hathor. So the next day, they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose to play. 
And play here can mean both a party type festival, but it can also mean a sensual type of play, sexual type of thing. So how is our society repeating this? Do I have to ask? Our society is overrun with sex in ads, on the internet, in entertainment of all kinds, and even in the halls of government where immorality is not only being legalized, but promoted. And censorship of those who oppose it is coming out of the halls of government too. When we give a nod to these things, we are worshiping the golden calf. And the third way that this worship of the golden calf is repeated in the end times is that the government that will come is going to be a golden calf. As we said, Hathor mirrored the ancient Sumerian goddess Inanna, who is the goddess behind Mystery Babylon, the harlot. Egyptians referred to Hathor as the mistress or harlot in the skies. So this fits. Hathor was the Egyptian version of the same fallen deity or fallen angel as Inanna, Ishtar, Astarte. These are all the same demonic power, just with names that are culturally relevant to each location. The beast that we see in Revelation 13 has seven heads, and each one is full of blasphemous names, Revelation 13, 1. Well, what are those names? Although we're not told, likely they're the names of the false gods from each of the kingdoms the heads represent. So each head had its representative gods' names on it. But they are, in essence, the same gods, just with different names. The Egyptians connected Hathor with foreign lands such as Canaan, so they understood that she was an imported goddess, probably at the dispersion that happened at the Tower of Babel. So this goddess of the golden calf is the goddess behind Mystery Babylon, the coming global system of governance that will dominate money, government, and entertainment, and that will be worshipped throughout the world. So this is Bible teacher and House of Walters. And we realize that you watch this channel for information just like this that you can't get elsewhere. And if you haven't done it yet, be sure to subscribe because that pushes these videos out to a wider audience. And I'm sure you can agree, many more Christians need to see this type of information. Now, getting back to the golden calf, the fourth way worship of the golden calf is repeated in the end times is how our churches and pastors are promoting this golden calf worship. You know, it was Aaron, the high priest of Israel, who made the calf. How did this happen? The story is very revealing. It was the people who called on Aaron, the high priest, to make this golden calf, something that they were familiar with back in Egypt. When the people saw Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, and that it's a picture of Jesus being a long time since he ascended into heaven and before he returns. The people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Exodus 32.1 They wanted a god to do what Yahweh did for them, going before them as a pillar of cloud and fire, protecting them. The people of the congregation were the ones demanding this type of false worship. And it's the vast majority in our churches who want a worldly form of worship, one that matches what society is promoting through media. Wonder why are we ignoring the signs of hard times that are all around us? Because people are demanding something else. Tickling of their ears, so to speak, and many pastors are giving them what they're asking for. And the congregation back in the Exodus days paid for the calf by giving the gold earrings they had, the ones they had taken from Egypt actually, and gave them to Aaron to make the calf. The churches in today's world are supporting a lot of what the world wants by going to movies that they shouldn't go to, supporting politicians that they shouldn't support, etc. Christians are paying for the promotion of this goddess worship. Now, a question I asked myself was, why was Aaron able to make this calf? Did you ever think about that? The reason is surprising. It's because he did it before, in my opinion. He did it before? 
Hathor's main temple was located in northern Egypt, which is where the Hebrews were located. Goshen was in northern Egypt. So the Israelites were aware of her. She was the main god in that area. In fact, consider this verse. Then all the people tore off the gold rings where they were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took them from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a molten calf. Exodus 32, 3 and 4. So the question I have at this point is how did Aaron know how to melt gold and use an engraving tool to fashion it? Was this a task that he had back in Egypt? Was he a craftsman for the Egyptians making little idols for them? Is that what he did before the Exodus? We aren't told in the Bible. Now, if he did, Aaron would have had lots of experience making idols for them. So this would have been no big deal. So this is something to consider. And is this why he chose to make a Hathor idol? If it was what he already knew how to make from previous experience. In our society today, why do pastors know how to engage in worship of the golden calf of our society's gods because they've done it their whole lives on their TVs, through their political views, their desire for money, etc. They are making it seem like worship of the one true God. But it's exactly what Aaron did. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and that means the calf, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yehovah and linked the holy name to this idolatry, as if he was passing it off as sort of like the worship of the one true God. And in a lot of ways, isn't that exactly what a lot of our churches are doing today? Now, the fifth way worship of the golden calf is repeated is in the destruction of the tablets of the Ten Commandments by Moses. God is doing this right now, and most of us don't see it. When Moses broke the tablets, these were engraved by the hand of God, a gift to the people, a precious gift. If you think about it, God's law is one of the greatest gifts he can give us. His law protects us from harming ourselves by going where we shouldn't go. This is exactly what has transpired in our world today. Think about it. Look what Romans 1.28 says. And just as they did not see it fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. The protection of God's word has been taken out of our society. And you can see what effect it has had, unfortunately, and where it is going. Now, the sixth way worship of the golden calf is repeated is strange. Very strange. And after Moses broke the tablets of the Ten Commandments, he melted the golden calf and ground it into powder. He placed the powder on the water and made the people drink it. The unfaithful who drank died in a plague, and the faithful lived. Yeah, that's pretty strange, isn't it? But do you see how this is like a mirror opposite of the red heifer ceremony, where the heifer was burned with fire till it was ashes, and the ashes were mixed with water, and the people were sprinkled to gain ritual purity. The first way that this grinding to gold and, and making people drink it is going to repeat is that Israel is planning to do a blasphemous red heifer ceremony to enable them to try to achieve the purity that Jesus won for everyone once and for all on the cross. This makes this coming red heifer a false idol, a golden calf, a false purity. The second way that this will repeat in the end times is that at the time of Moses, something taken into a person's body made them die of plague. 
in the end times? Will this be some sort of genetic upgrade that's associated with the mark of the beast, the kind of thing that the people wanted? And of course, if so, this will lead them to death. We see this mentioned in several places in scripture, like at the fifth trumpet, where the demon locusts sting people, but they're unable to die even though they want to from the pain they're in from these demon locusts. Why is that? Is it because of a genetic upgrade? And also, at the first bowl, where loathsome sores come upon all the people who have the mark. Why just the people with the mark? We learn in Daniel 2.44 that the iron and the clay do not adhere to each other. Is this possibly talking about a genetic upgrade there? We've talked about this in previous videos. We believe it is. And does this mean that in the future, this genetic upgrade that these people are getting isn't going to adhere? And eventually it's going to break down, possibly leading to these type of sores. Now on this channel, we've postulated about this transhumanism in a number of different videos. It's a big deal for the Globus. This is a direction they want to go. And a genetic change may be associated with the mark of the beast. And it may be what causes these things. Boils being unable to die. So click right here to keep watching if you want to learn more and discover why and how these things are going to happen. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.